Welcome to Wadsworth History on Film, a program presented by the Wadsworth Area Historical Society and designed to record the oral history of Wadsworth for posterity. I'm Cesar Carino, your host, and our guest today is Kenny Flood. Kenny, this is your second time back because you had such a rich history to offer us the last time that we didn't finish. As a matter of fact, we went one full hour the last time and we got up to your eighth birthday. And you've had a few beyond that, I believe. You're, what, 83 now, is that correct? Right. So we have a few more years to go. And I think we stopped pretty well at, um, you were telling us about your paper route, which went all the way from what is now Broad Street, all the way down to Johnson Road, which is now Johnson Road on Silver Creek Road. Then you went east all the way to George Lozier's house. Then you came back and went all the way to Homestead Road which is still off Johnson Road. Then you went south on Homestead, came back down, and then you went east again on Johnson and north on Silver Creek, and then what is now Silver Crest Road, and you had taken us all the way up to the very, very end of Silver Crest, which is right by uh, the railroad tracks. Now, do you want to start there and tell us on the way back then who lived where? and? Uh, you uh, had told us about the Hutchisons and so forth. Uh, well, I got, we got as far as the Ryder family. Right. And the next family was uh, the Klostermans, Joe Klostermans, Klostermans mm -hmm. parents. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and Joe Klosterman was a newspaper person and for the Wadsworth News Banner for the Wadsworth Papers for about 50 years or so, wasn't he? Yes. <clears throat> he had uh, three sisters, uh, Sophie and Mary, and I don't recollect the last, mm -hmm. the older one's name. And then we, then there was a vacant lot, and there was a Tolley family. Tolley? Tolley. Mm -hmm. John Tolley. And they had a daughter that uh, was my age, and she had polio. I see. Mm -hmm. And she had to wear braces on both legs. They called it infantile paralysis in those days, didn't they? Right. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, we get back to that when I got in high school. I hauled her back and forth to school. Oh, did you? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so. In a car, perhaps? Pardon? In the car? Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, then went on to the Parkinson family. They were at the very end? No, no. there was uh, another. There was uh, two elderly ladies lived together in a house, but I didn't pass the paper there, and I didn't know their names. Mm -hmm. But then I went on down along the side of the old Chemitex or XL rubber it was. And uh, Which is the, now the Barefoot Soul or Eggleston. And, where the Barefoot Soul right. is or was. And uh, along the siding there was a caboose there and one of the railroaders lived in it. And his name was Butler Keel. Bl Butler? Butler Keel. And he lived in the caboose? Lived in the caboose. And he took my paper and uh, said to me one day, he said, Ken, he said, uh, you've got a long ways to walk. And he said, I'm going to buy you a pony. Oh. So I thought that was great because I was always crazy about horses. So. Anyway, before Butler got to buy me the pony, he died. <laughs> then I'd go across the I'd, then I'd go across the railroad track to another Klosterman family and the Hosel family. And I went up as far as Bird Street, the Kraska family, mm -hmm. and Mrs. Henchy, uh, Roy Henchy's mother, lived on the corner. Roy and Fred Henchy's mother. Then I come back and there was a siding there that went up past, went across Broad Street. To the Henry Cole and Ice. To the Henry Cole and Ice. And uh, uh, Jake Weason was the tender. He took care of the engines. And uh, every, well, a few times that uh, Jake was going to take some coal up to his house. He lived on First Street there. And uh, he'd let me run the engine. Uh, and he'd stop it. And I got to pull the lever to bring it back. And 
That's the, yeah. the big engines on the railroad. Oh, yeah. Those huge things. And you're only eight years old at the time. Huh? Yeah. Wow. Eight or nine. Eight or nine. Mm -hmm. So then uh, I'd spend some time there with Jake, and he'd be telling me about the engines and how he had to clean the flutes out. And uh, then I'd cut across the field. And before I, we leave Jake Wiesen, he was kind of a colorful character, wasn't he? Yes. Could you tell uh, us a little bit about Jake Wiesen? Well, uh, he wasn't, he was colorful as far as uh, some people thought, but uh, when I was with him, he was talking serious about the engines and everything. Right. Mm -hmm. And Jake would buy anything that I would sell. Is that right? He bought the paper, the Times and the Press before they went together and the Beacon Journal. And uh, as I told you, I passed the pictorial review, and he'd take one of them every month. Uh, every once in a while, he'd miss a payment. He wouldn't pay me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, so I, if it got dark on me, Jake would give me an Erie Railroad lantern to go home with. Oh, my, yes. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, so then I'd go up to Doc Hamil Hamilton. Now, why'd they call him Doc Hamilton? He was a veterinarian. Right. Mm -hmm. And he lived where the Haynes family lived later on. Which is where? Well, it's, uh, well. Bird and what? No. Or the first, first no. one. It was on Durling Drive. On Durling Drive. Mm -hmm. So he, I can't. Teddy, I don't know whether you remember where the Cox family oh, lived. Oh, yeah, surely, Rudy Cox. Mm -hmm. Well, he lived beyond that. Okay, and there were, those were open fields then, weren't they? Yes. And right now they're houses on yes. Durning Drive. But Rudy Cox and then he had, what, two sons or three? Two. Well, that was uh, oh, wait, Rudy's, no. Rudy's Rudy was one of the boys. Boy. And Rudy had a brother. Rudy had a brother, Ted. Ted Cox and then the old man. Well, the other, the Bert father, Cox. Bert Cox, and their mother was gone. No, she was living was while she? I was there, was while she? I was passing papers. And she had uh, two sons. One's name was Roar Lyle, and the other, I forget. Mm -hmm. And then you went on, Rudy uh, had a horse, and he was a character. Yeah. Tell us about Rudy Cox. Rudy used to like to drink. A little bit. Pretty mm -hmm. good. <laughs> and uh, of course, he never got in any trouble. Never got married either, did he? No. Mm -hmm. And later on, after Bert had died, and uh, he and Jake Mackey, the one I told you about, right. the baseball player, uh, had sort of a shack down almost close to where the streetcar track was. Mm -hmm. Back in a field there. In a field. Mm -hmm. And uh, Rudy and he lived there, and every once in a while they'd have somebody else in. And uh, before I get too far, beyond the Wiesen home, there was sort of a barn there. And uh, the big Russian. Yes, and Big Andy. Big Andy. Mm -hmm. uh, he had a big cart, and he'd push that up Broad Street full of papers. Mm -hmm. He'd pick papers up. And he was about six feet six or so, wasn't he? He was l l tall, tall, tall and thin. And Big uh, mustache, as I remember. Yeah. And uh, was from Russia. Yeah. And they called him Big Andy. Mm -hmm. And uh, he couldn't uh, speak too well English. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had two fellows that lived with him. And they'd get in a fight, get to drinking, and they'd get in a fight. And the one fellow's name was Vasily Androhovich. Vasily Androhovich. And we called him One-Eyed Willie. One-Eyed Willie, why? Well, he and Andy got into a fight. And Andy poked his eye out. Wow. 
Then the other fellow was Roy Lyle, Roy Lytle. Roy Lytle. Lytle, and that that wasn't his true name. Mm -hmm. And was uh, he from Russia too? I can't tell you what his nationality nationality was, but anyway, uh, he lost an eye. And uh, Big Andy, and he got in a fight. The, the ophthalmologist must want to know how Andy knew how to take care of this little problem. Well, <laughs> anyway, uh, this Lytle, or Lytel, he would, uh, in the wintertime, uh, he'd do something around town and they'd put him up in the county jail and he'd stay up there all winter. So then one winter, uh, Tommy Lucas told him that he was not allowed to go up to county jail and he better keep his nose clean. Hey, Tommy Lucas was the marshal at that time, right? He was the marshal, chief of police. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> Tommy didn't do a thing about him, so uh, he got back in the alley between uh, where the old liquor store used to be. Oh, in an um, alley back on, through um, there. Yeah, behind where Hoagland Hardware, where Holmesbrook is right now, and where Business Utilities is right now, uh, and where the um, parking lot for for Ritzman Center in that area, right there. Yes. Well, it was. He went into the alley. It was where this Warner Cable uh, right. office is. Right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, he went back there and. Uh, some children thought that he exposed himself. I see. So Tommy picked him up and he spent another winter up at the county jail. So then we can get back to Bert Cox. And this is back uh, on Durling Drive now. Back on Durling Drive. Between Durling Drive and the streetcar track or the railroad track. Right. And uh, the next house down was Tom Long. Tom Long, mm -hmm. he had uh, something wrong with his uh, uh, feet, did he not? Well, he he had gotten pretty well intoxicated. I see. And he was laying on the streetcar track and had both legs cut off. Oh, that's what it was. Mm -hmm. where, where did that happen in Wadsworth? Down by the XL stop for Which the streetcar. Which was not car. Too, hard, too far from his house. Right. Mm -hmm. Actually, lay, he lay on the on the streetcar track. I think he fell asleep. Fell asleep there. It kind of woke him up, I'm sure, when that streetcar ran over his legs. God well, bless him. That's too bad. And he had uh, three boys and a girl. Mm -hmm. And uh, then he had, well, his one boy, I think, is still living. Eddie lives in Florida. Mm -hmm. And then the next house, a fellow by the name of... Uh, that was horrible about those legs, though. Gee whiz. I mean, uh, I remember that he had a difficult time walking, but I didn't realize that he had had that, such a devastating accident. Well, that's just pitiful. Mm -hmm. And uh, the next family was Charlie Nichols. And he married a That's lady. That's on Durling Drive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He married. He was an old bachelor, and he married a lady with ha three girls. Mm -hmm. I ran into one of the girls yesterday, the youngest girl. You remember her name? Darlene. I mean the uh, the mother's name, her maiden name, or married name with whatever. Oh, Barry. Barry. Mm -hmm. And she was a sister. Uh, to Mrs. Jake Weason. Okay, a sister to Mrs. Jake Weason. Right. Mm -hmm. And then there was Lois Berry. She was the oldest. And then the one in the middle was, uh, well, I just can't think of that right now, mm -hmm. but uh, she was married to Woodrow Vincent. To Woodrow Vincent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. His dad ran the store down. Store down, the Vincent store down in the south end of town. Corner of uh, Water Street and right. Maine. And then the next place was Magookan. Magookan. They lived back off the road a little bit, didn't they? 
No, they live pretty close. No, Snyder's live back off the road. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they had one daughter, Marion Magookan. And then the next place was Bill Long. He was Tom's brother. Mm -hmm. and the one who was, lost his legs. Pardon? I mean, Tom lost his legs. Yeah. Yeah. On a horrible accident. And uh, they had no children. And uh, his nephew's name was Bill, and uh, he used to work for his uncle. Mm -hmm. And they raised chickens, sold eggs, chickens. The next place was the Murray. Murray's. Mm -hmm. And uh, old Grandpa Murray lived there, and uh, he. And Bill Murray, his son, lived with him, mm -hmm. uh, Bill and Blanche. And uh, they had three daughters. Three daughters. Mm -hmm. And later on, Bill moved to town, and uh, Jimmy Murray moved in. The uh, a boy and three girls, weren't they? Yes. Mm -hmm. Jimmy was the baby, I believe. Yeah. Then Doris, Margaret. And uh, Margaret married Dombrowski. Right. And then what's the oldest girl's name? I don't remember. Can't remember either. Mm -hmm. And then across the road was Agnes Murray, Eddie Agnes Murray's Murray. mother. Eddie Murray's mother. They were related somewhat, weren't they? Yes. Uh, that was Bill and Jimmy's brother that lived there, and he died. I see. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, the people from Silver Creek went together and uh, built that home for him. I know my dad helped on that. Your dad was a carpenter, a right. finished carpenter, as a matter of fact. We need to talk about him pretty soon, too. And the house we're talking about was a little stucco house, was it not? Right. Mm -hmm. And then Bill Murray lived in there in the 30s. No. And, no, no Eddie, Eddie Murray. Murray. Eddie Murray lived there in the 30s and 40s, right? Right. Uh, he worked at the injectors, I remember. Yes, he Right did. next door to the Marins. Then, then the next house was Marty Marin. Marty Marin. Mm -hmm. And Marty's family still lives in Wadsworth. As a matter of fact, um, uh, he had, what, uh, two boys and a girl, or two boys and two girls? Two boys and three girls. Three girls? Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, Tom Marin lives in Silver Creek now at the far end of Silver Creek, cl close to Doylestown. On the old Louis Thomas farm. Yep, and Jim Marin still lives at the house, doesn't he? Right. And then um, his uh, sister uh, married, um, oh, uh, Whitman, Jerry Whitman. One of those yeah. girls Alice, married. Al Alice married Jerry Whitman. And, and Kate, Jerry's, she was married to... Uh, a freed. Freed, mm hmm. And uh, Mac, they had uh, an apartment upstairs in their home at that time. And Mac Mullaney and his wife lived above the, in their home. Mac Mullaney and his wife. And uh, Mac and Nell, which is, was his wife. And Nell just died the other, not too long ago at age 101. Yes. And uh, Mary Catherine and Leo was the children. And Mary Catherine was, um, uh, it lives in Doylestown, and she was Mary Catherine, Huff, uh, Mary Catherine Huffman, was she not? No. No? Mary Catherine Workman. Workman, she I mean, no, Workman. I'm sorry, Workman, not Huffman, Workman, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, she, uh, she passed away not too not long. Not too long ago. And Leo lives out west somewhere, doesn't he, right now, or is he back in town? Leo passed away. Oh, Leo passed away too. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we'll go back to Silver Creek on the north side. And uh, the house on the north side, the first house, as you come into Silver Creek there, after you pass the, across the streetcar track, right. mm -hmm. uh, a fellow by the name of Bill Hilton lived there. Bill Hilton, right. Mm -hmm. Uh, who later then moved to Wadsworth. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, then a pe people by the name of Lemon. He Lemon. was a mm -hmm. railroader, lived there for a while. Bill Hilton used to work at the Ohio Brass Company years ago. 
I believe he did. Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, then we got. We he got has a son, Bill, who still lives in Wadsworth. Right. Mm -hmm. And he had two other boys. Well, he had Ronald. Lena May, too, was a girl. Mm -hmm. What was her name? Lena May Hilton was one yes. of the girls. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had Kenneth Hilton, and, Kenneth, Kenny Hilton and Ronald Hilton. And Ron, that's correct. Mm -hmm. uh, Ronald took his life, his own life. I didn't realize that. Mm -hmm. And when Kenneth, would that have been? Well, that was when I was about in the eighth grade. Eighth grade, or so ninth. That would have been about 19, 28, 29, somewhere in that area. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, then the next house, there was a house up on the ridge, up on an embankment there. Uh, they didn't take the paper, and I didn't know who they were. They didn't, they didn't take the paper. You didn't check their names out. No. <laughs> and uh, Could that have been Long's, by chance? No, I don't know. The house burned one time, did it not? I think it did. Yeah. Anyway, think, the next house mm -hmm. from that was Maywood Dunn. Maywood Dunn, mm -hmm. who then friend, then moved on to Durling Drive, way up there, closer to uh, right opposite the school drive of the high school. Is that correct? Well, it could be, but that was after my time. Yeah, Maywood Dunn. He had a son, uh, um, Victor. Victor Dunn, and they lived. They moved from there, and they went all the way up to on Durling Drive, opposite what is now School Drive. It could be. Yes. Mm -hmm. That was after I. Right. Mm -hmm. So then uh, we go up the hill a little ways, and uh, uh, people by the name of Swaggart lived there. Swaggart. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the, right as you, as you crest the hill. Right. And then later on, the Harpley family moved in. No. No. Uh, the Barnhart family moved in there. Oh, the Barnharts. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then the next house was, well, Mrs., uh, by the way, Mrs. Maywood Dunn was a sister to Mrs. Ed Rich and Norm Long. That's right. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we move on to uh, the Boyle family. They were related to the, to the uh, Lozier's. Mm -hmm. And they had three boys, I think, and a girl. Now, they lived where? They lived in the house beside the Swaggarts. Which is still on the crest of the hill going up. Right. Mm -hmm. OK. Then there's a field. A field. And uh, Gib Bailey lived there. Bailey's. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had a Jackie Bailey. She was, uh, she was a tag along, or she was born after Gib died. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, then they had Arthur Bailey, which we call Boom. Boom, Boom Bailey. Mm -hmm. And he had infantile paralysis. Right. He's kind of a character, wasn't he? What a wonderful person, though, Boom was. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, Why would we call him Boom? Do you have any idea? No, I don't. And then there was Louie. And then they had a, an older sister. But it was, it was Louie. Martha. It was Louis Fritz, though, wasn't it? Who? Louis Fritz, or was it Louis Bailey? Louis Bailey. OK. And uh, then and Martha, Martha, she Bailey. was the oldest. Mm -hmm. And then after Gib died, uh, she married a Fritz. Mm -hmm. And uh, they Bill Fritz, wasn't it? Bill Fritz? I can't say for mm -hmm. sure. Anyway, he had a son, Kenny. Kenny Fritz. Kenny mm -hmm. Fritz. And then he and Mrs. Bailey had... Uh, Mary and Jackie. Jackie no, and Mary. No, Jackie was a Bailey. Okay, then Betty and uh, Mary. Mary and Betty. Betty and Mary. Right. Uh, Fritz. Yeah, Betty uh, married a um, uh, person who had the um, um, sheet metal shop um, east of town. The name will come to me in a minute. She died at an early age. Right. Then Jenkins. She married a Jenkins, Jenkins right. That's mm -hmm. true. Mm -hmm. And uh, the next house, people by the name of Spake, Spake. lived there. And uh, they had two daughters. And uh, after they moved out, why well, Nick and Mary came and finally, in. Mm -hmm. They moved in. Right. 
And uh, then we go on down the hill, and it was Hickman's. Hickman's, uh, Vern Hickman and Vern Lomi Hickman. And Lomi. Right. Mm -hmm. And they had a boy named Dan. Bob. And uh, Herb. Bob and. Herb. Uh, Herb. And then they had a daughter. Jane. Jane. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we go on, there was sort of an open field there, and the Hodges lived Hodges there. Hodges lived there. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had. Well, I told you the story about Sam. Mm -hmm. So we've had two people now who have had their feet cut off or legs cut off by the streetcar of the tracks. Well, one by the railroad, and, and one Sam's by the, was by the railroad. By the road, and the other one, and poor Mr. Long by the... By the streetcar Wow, track. that's just horrible. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then the next house was the house that you were born in. I was born in that house. Mm -hmm. John Max owned that home. John Max. He had two boys and a girl. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had, uh, I don't remember the girl's name, and the oldest boy was John, or uh, Max. Max. Uh, no, not Max. Max was his last name. Max. Uh, Paul Max. Paul Max. Mm -hmm. And then the other boy was Charles. Charles still living. Uh, he was sort of a character. Uh, he had asthma. Mm -hmm. And he'd travel all over the country. And uh, maybe you'd see him one spring or summer, and then you wouldn't see him for two or three years, then he right. would show mm -hmm. up. And, Where does uh, he live now? I, he, he married. Mm -hmm. And then he was living, the last time I knew, uh, he came to my house up on Broad Street, and he and his wife came there. And uh, he was, well, he used to be great friends to Mr. and Mrs. Sinks mm -hmm. that lived on Fairview. Mm -hmm. And uh, he used to visit them quite a bit. I see. Mm -hmm. Then the next house was Mullaney's. My parents moved into that house on July 10th, 1926. I remember when, remember they, when they moved but in. But I couldn't tell you the date. Mm -hmm. And uh, because your folks and my folks became very, very good close friends. friends, right. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then there was the Mullaney family. John Mullaney. John Mullaney. And uh, his wife, and they had... Uh, Her name was Kate. Kate. Mm -hmm. And they had, uh, I think it was four boys and one girl, Mary. Uh, she, Mary Elizabeth. Mary, Mary Elizabeth was born there. Mm -hmm. That was Mary's daughter. She had married a Huffman. Okay, um, Mary Elizabeth was John Mulaney's granddaughter. Right. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. And uh, and her mother was um, Mary Mullaney. Mary Mullaney. Mm -hmm. So Mary uh, Bernard Mullaney. Uh, he had lived. I forget. It was down around Crestline. I think it was. Mm -hmm. But he'd be back every Sunday to play ball. And uh, then there was Eddie. And Charlie Mullaney and Mac Mullaney. Mac Mullaney. Mm -hmm. Mac lost his leg on a railroad switch at Jones's Crossing. Right there, close to where he lived. He was, so that's three people in Silver Creek who lost their legs, their limbs, or legs in all three cases, just very close to where they lived, except for Sam, uh, Sam Hodge, who lost his, uh, when his mother was trying to go under the train. Mm -hmm. Over on Manchester Road. Manchester Road. And uh, Mac was switching before they had the tower. And they'd get in there and unlock it, you know, mm -hmm. and then and Mac pull got it. his foot, they'd pull that track over. And uh, Mac got caught and the train was coming. He couldn't get loose. Do you remember it at all? I don't remember it. No. It was before we moved there. Before you moved there. Mac was an older, how old would Mac be now if he were living? 
Oh, gosh. I Over 100, probably. Probably, because mm -hmm. Mel was better than 100 when she died. Yeah, she died at 100. Um, 101. 101, yeah. Mm -hmm. Then uh, we were back up the hill, and it was the Yaki family. The Yaki family. Um, to, could you tell us a little bit about the Yaki farm? That farm now is wintergreen allotment. There are over 200 houses there. But when I was growing up and when you were growing up, there was a barn there that said 1893, Yaki 1893. So evidently that barn was built in 1893. It's torn down now. But do you remember the Yakis? Oh, yes. They were there when we moved <coughs> to Silver Creek. And uh, there was Newt and... Newt Yaki. And I forget his, I know his wife's name, but Alma. Alma Yaki. And she was a razor. Alma Razor. The same razor family that's in Wadsworth? Right. Which, which razor family? Well, uh, uh, they're probably all related one to another, oh, are yes. they not? Mm -hmm. Well, Bill, Bill Razor lives here in town. Right. Uh, Bill's about 75 now. That was his aunt. Aunt. And he lives Alma. out on College Street. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, then there was uh, Bill Yaki, young Bill. And, uh, oh, the girl, I forget her name. Yaki girl. And Grandma and Grandpa, I called them Grandma and Grandpa Yaki. And, that was uh, Newt's father and mother. Right. Mm -hmm. They had originally owned the, well, they owned the farm. And uh, they didn't live there too many years after we moved there. And uh, I remember I used to go down and help them, and, and uh, I'd go out in the field with them, and I always liked to ride them horses back, you know, with the harness on and everything, and some of them be sweaty, and yeah. uh, I had to ride them horses. So then after they moved away from there, Jerry Deedle. Jerry Deedle from Pennsylvania. Myersdale, Pennsylvania. Myersdale, Pennsylvania, with his wife, Sarah. Sarah. Who had a bit of a uh, speech impediment, did she not? Right. She couldn't say chickens too well. No. Uh, there was many things that she couldn't say too well, but... She was a good cook. Oh, I understand that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I used to help Jerry, and my mother and I used to, uh, they'd give us uh, milk, and they would give us, uh, Sarah always made butter, and she'd give us homemade butter and buttermilk. And in turn, why I and my mother would help them, mom would help most of the time when uh, we husk corn. So Jerry would tell Mom all the time that when she come to an ear that was full, a full ear, eared out to the end to throw it out, and uh, then we'd get about a bushel, maybe two bushel of corn, and uh, he gave us that, and we would uh, Mom would take it home, and she would parch it in the old coal stove. Then we would shell it, and I'd take it to the mill along the railroad track south end. And uh, we ate a lot of mush. Uh, in the evening, we'd have hot mush and milk. And in the morning, Mom would pour the others out in a pan, and we'd have fried mush for breakfast. So, uh, it didn't seem to hurt you much. You are the oldest in your family, but you still have three sisters, the youngest of whom is about 75 years old. Is that right? Betty. No, Ruth. Ruth. Uh, Ruth is what? Well, she's nine years younger than I am. And you're 83. I'm 83. So, so she's 74. She's 74. Mm -hmm. 74. So it didn't hurt you much. <laughs> no, and uh, my dad lived to be 93. 93, and your mother about 100, close to 100, wasn't well, she? Well, mom, mom died in April, and she would have been 97 in 97, I in know June. she was very, mm -hmm. wonderful, wonderful people. And uh, we always had our own potatoes, and we raised uh, cattle.
cabbage and carrots. Big garden. A big garden and plenty of potatoes. Your mother had a special gift that very few people had, and that was that she was able to clean intestines for sausage filling before they had plastic sausage filling. And she was an absolute expert at that. Do you remember that at all? And she used to do that for a lot of the neighbors. And your father was an outstanding carpenter. As a matter of fact, there are three or four stories that I can remember, and one of them is going to be telling on you here. Uh, and you told this story, you probably don't remember it, but I think that uh, it bears telling again. And I'm going to see if I can't remind you of it and see if you will tell us about it. Your dad was probably 85 years old, and you were putting on a roof <laughs> in your garage. Is that right? No, it was an addition to our house on Broad Street. addition to your house on Broad Street. And um, uh, he was extremely accurate on anything. And what, what happened there? <laughs> well, I'd, I'd laid a shingle, and he was on one end, and I was on the other. And I got a little bit crooked. And, and he said, get the H out of here. He said, if you can't do it right, he said, don't do it at all. <laughs> That's he how was 75 he was. at that oh, 75 time. 75 at that time, but he was crawling on roofs. And he'd had a colostomy. Mm -hmm. He had had cancer, and he had a colostomy. And uh, he'd take a half a bundle of shingles and go up that ladder. By himself. Mm -hmm. An excellent carpenter. He worked for... Um, B B uh, Bill Re Weaver. Weaver and Barberton. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, the only tools he had were hand tools. There were nothing, and yet... When he made an angle, a 45 degree angle, uh, I think some of the tool companies came by to see if they could true up their, their squares with his angles. They were so good. I, I still remember his doing it. He had a particular way to do it and it had to be done perfectly. He was a cabinet maker, just an well, outstanding he, cabinet maker. He could read that scale, and he only went to the sixth grade. Mm -hmm. And uh, he could read that scale and uh, I remember one time I had a fella come up and to put some, I had some wooden steps on bef at our house before we tore that stone, uh, porch off. And this fella came up and said he'd put the steps on for me, some new steps. And I said, do you know how to use a scale to cut that? And he says, oh, I know how, but he said, I'll just trace it off of the old step. <laughs> well, I knew right then that he didn't know how to. He didn't know how to do it. He didn't know how to use that. And uh, one day, I was uh, I was secretary of the Eagles Club at the time, and uh, I was in there talking to the fellow that tended the bar and. Uh, there were two fellows from Barberton, and they were talking. And uh, I was standing right there. I couldn't help but hear them talk. And the one fellow said, uh, have you ever been in Doc Taylor's home over in Gardner Allotments at Norton? That's one of the most prestigious homes in, on that street. And Bill Weaver built that home. Yes. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, this fellow said, if you ever wanted to see a work of art, you should see that turn and a half stairway. He said, I wonder who built that. You knew. And I turned around and I tapped him on the shoulder and I said, that was my father. What a legacy. And <laughs> so anyway, he, he couldn't believe that my dad was still living, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he was very strict about everything. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. And I remember when uh, we put the addition on the house, in our old kitchen, there was a, a drop-off. It would have been about, mm -hmm. oh, maybe four inches. It would have come out like this and yes. down. Mm -hmm. I said, I don't want that. My dad said, I don't know how you're going to get around it. And he said, uh, you're going to have to live with it. And I said, well, I'm not going to live with it. And uh, so then my wife's cousin was a carpenter, and he said I had to do the same thing. And I said, well, I'm not going to do it. 
So when I was working at the injector, I took a file that was about an inch and a half file, and I made an auger. And where we cut the tube fours off, they were hanging down, and I went on every one of them and made them even so that that whole thing was across. Then, I, then we put, John Burke had helped me, and we put two tuba sixes and a piece of six inch quarter by six piece of steel in there and put it together to hold that up. What did your dad say to that? Uh, he didn't say much. Didn't say too much, but you got it done. Kenny, you know, you are the only person that we've had on the shows that we've had uh, to tell us about all of the people in Silver Creek, and that's a, a very vital part because I think Silver Creek predates the city of Wadsworth with its coal mines way back in the early 1800s. There's still a lot more to your life than we need to hear. We're up to your eighth birthday now. We have to get farther than that. But before we go into your civic duties here in Wadsworth and the things that you did as, as the oldest living service director, I mean safety director in the city of Wadsworth. No. Is, who's, who else? Yes, I am too. Yeah, Perry yeah, the, Lee's older than I am. Is Perry older than you? Oh, yes. And he was a service, he was a safety, safety director, director too. Director. Right. So then we, we will have two of them because we're going to be interviewing Perry too. Uh -huh. But you were, you're one of those old time service or safety directors and we want to hear about that in a couple of minutes. But before we do, we have the, um, a little bit of history about the old normal school in Wadsworth, and, which is Wadsworth Centralized School which then became Isham School, which is presently Isham School. And you were in the last class of the Old Normal School, is that correct? Uh, the, you were there the last year that was, that, that, it was, that it stood. I think I was in the third grade. Third grade. This is your third grade picture, is it not? I'd like to have people take a peek That's at That's the second grade picture. Oh, this picture. is second grade. This was the, this was the, um, uh, a year before they tore it down. Right. And this was the old normal school. In front of the old normal In school. In front of the old normal school. They tore that down and then they made the, uh, what is now presently the um, Isham School. Is that correct? Well, they built a big long building out in the back. They called that the chicken the coop. The chicken coop. Why did they build that building? Well, that stored every, all the classes. Mm hmm. And, uh, then uh, after that, after the new building was built, I think that uh, we, I moved in back in there in the fourth grade. Which was what year? Probably 1927? Well, 19, this one was, uh, it would be oh, yeah. a year previous to okay, that. This is 1925, 25. 26 when you're in the sixth grade. Well, I was in the fourth grade. So this so would have been 1923 uh, that you moved into the, uh, that's the, uh, the sixth grade picture. And I understand that you can tell us everyone's names here. We're not going to ask you to do that right this very minute, but could you tell us who the teacher is there? That was Ethel Wirtz. Ethel Wirtz. And who was your second grade teacher? Miss Sprunger. Miss Sprunger. Mm -hmm. And... Um, Springer, I'll have Ms. to Springer. correct that because I had another teacher named Springer. Springer, Miss Miss Springer. Mm -hmm. Springer. Uh, if we have time, we'll go through these names, but uh, let's go from there quickly because we have just about um, uh, six minutes left in this hour. And tell us about the years that you were safety director in the city of Wadsworth. Who was the chief of police? Who were the policemen? And what did you do? And how does it change between what you did then and what you're doing, what they do now in the safety department and all of the different kinds of things that, have, that are going on? Well, I was safety director from 1943 to 1947. Under which mayor? Under Mayor, mayor Barris Birkbeck. Bar Barris Birkbeck, who had been a, what, postmaster? In Wadsworth? Uh, he had been, right. yes. And then after that, Barris Birkbeck, um, I think on either Frank Street or one of those streets up there north of town, did they open a Kaiser? Up on Talbert Street. Talbert Street. What, what did he do up there? 
Well, he got he received the agency up there for what what automobile? For the Kaiser Fraser. Kaiser Fraser, which lasted only a few years and it then didn't it last too didn't long. last so long. Mm -hmm. But he got that that he he had that as a right as a part of his uh, experience. And what did you do as safety director at that time, Kenny? Well, uh, I at the time I was secretary of the Fraternal Order of Eagles, and uh, I'd just gotten out of the sanatorium and uh, over at Edwin Shaw. You had had some tr trouble with your lungs, is that right? And uh, I couldn't go back to work at the Goodrich where I worked and received that. So I was walking up the street and I, had, I was taking some books home to work on and uh, Glenn Brenneman stopped me on the street. Glenn Brenneman was the pharmacist who owned Brenneman's Drug Store on the corner of Broad and High. And Brenny always called me Keg. Keg. And uh, he stopped his car and he said, Keg, come on, get in the car. He said, I'll take you home. And uh, so I got in the car. Brenny was a very good friend of mine. Mm -hmm. And he thought a lot of my sister, Mary, and... Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people did, and still do. Mm -hmm. And he, he used to see that she went to Camp Craig every year. Why Camp Craig? Well, the, the handicapped children were taken up there for a week. Her only handicap was what, though? Uh, she was born with a little hand it had five little pieces of skin mm -hmm. uh, representing the fingers. fingers. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that was on her right hand. It was her right hand. With her left hand, though, she could do absolutely anything that anybody else could do and had one of the most beautiful handwritings I've ever seen in my life. That's true. And uh, she could run a typewriter as fast do as anybody, anybody else. Anybody could do absolutely anything that anybody else could do. And uh, my dad fixed her uh, a thing that she could hold the uh, violin. She mm -hmm. took a few lessons, but she didn't care for it. Mm -hmm. So anyway, Brenny took me home and he said, Keg, if Mayor Birkbeck is elected, how about you being safety director? And I said, well, Brenny, I said, uh, I'll talk it over with my wife and uh, I'll let you know. So I talked it over with Ruth and I said, well, I don't know whether I want to get mixed up in politics or not. And uh, so we talked it over and uh, they took me to the, I didn't know Birkbeck at the time, but I went to a dinner with Brenny, Jerry Hall, Joan Eath, and Birkbeck out at the El Commodore, went to a dinner. The El Commodore was west of town on College Street on the south side, right next to the ball field. That's true. And little we, diner type of thing. We had a, a dinner there, and after the dinner, why, uh, we uh, talked about politics. And uh, so then he was elected, and he appointed me. Do you remember whom, whom he ran against, Mayor Burbeck, Barris Burbeck ran against whom? We don't have to know that now, but I just. No, I don't, I don't remember. I should remember, but I don't. And uh, so I had charge of the police department, the fire department, and also the welfare department. And we had a welfare department in Wadsworth at that time. Uh, what did it do? What did the welfare department do? Didn't do much. Didn't do much. And uh, you know what they allowed me? How much? Per year, $200. For the welfare department. And, uh, and you didn't spend it all? No. <laughs> I think the first year, uh, there were, it was a family by the name of Double D that lived at the South End. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, Mrs. He, Double D and Mr. Double D. Yeah, Fred, she was a larger woman, nice person, very nice person. Fred died, and she was a widow lady, and mm -hmm. they didn't have a driveway back to the house. And she called me on the phone, and she said, "I need some coal." So I called Pete Basco, who had a hardware store and a coal yard in the South End on South Main Street, on the west side of the road. That's true. Mm -hmm. Then. He had a, he took a half a ton of coal up there and he couldn't get back to the house, so he dumped it in the front yard. And she called me and wanted me to come down and carry that back in the coal cellar. Well, I told her I'd try and get somebody to do it, but right at the present time, I didn't have the time. So then the police force consisted of Tommy Lucas was the chief. Uh, Harv Weldy. Harv Weldy, Ed Transu. Ed Transu. And Joe Horvath. Joe Horvath. And uh, so then I had two fellows. Well, they're both dead now. I don't know whether to name them or not, but uh, they were characters. And uh, they used to drink quite a bit, but I couldn't get anybody else because it was during the war. And uh, so I got them to paint. We had a, a board made with an angle on it up to the curb, and we'd paint the markings for the parking. Mm -hmm. Well, they'd paint a couple, and they'd get close to a beer joint, and they'd put the brush on the can and when they're to quench I'd, their thirst or something mm -hmm. I'd go down the street and, <laughs> and maybe I'd finish what they'd started on just one part before it dried mm -hmm. and then I'd go in and get them and and they'd work a little while and it took a long time to get it done so then at night we didn't have any radio, and and uh, they had a a Buick for a cruiser. Right, a 1941 Buick. And uh, this Buick was uh, being well; it was rough, roughly used. And they took the. Uh, we went to the council. I went to the council and said, "We need a new car." But there wasn't any. Yeah, because during the war, they didn't make any cars from 1941 to 1945. That's right. So I got a hold of the fella up at Mayfield Heights. His name was Marsh. And uh, he's, the agency is still there, Marsh Agency. And uh, I talked to him, and well, he said, I got just about the thing you need. He said, uh, I forget what police department had to order a special car with a special motor in it and, and uh, all the special things. And uh, he said they, they didn't take it. He said, would you like to have it? And I got the price on it. I forget what it was. And I went to the board of controls, which was the uh, safety director, the service director and the mayor, and that mm -hmm. was the Board of Controls. So we bought that. That was a 41 Ford, was it not? It was a 41 Ford with a large engine in Large it. engine. Mm -hmm. And the siren on top of it. Siren and yes. one light. No light bars at those oh, days. Oh, no. We had, we, it was a spotlight. Yeah, but, no, but you had no radio in the car. No. Police car with no radio. Radios weren't usually used. How did you communicate? Well, we, uh, the car used, there was a telephone booth there in front of the old monument. That was right at the square. Right mm -hmm. at the square and where the, where the water fountain was and uh, also where the watering trough was. And uh, the car was always parked there, the police car. And over on the corner of the, uh, bank by building. the citizen bank was mm -hmm. a, on the telephone pole, there was a light. A red light. And uh, they would call 
into the telephone company. Which was Star Telephone at that time. And the offices were above uh, where Ann's Pastry Shop is now, or in that area, is that That's correct? That's true. Mm -hmm. And then they would, uh, uh, she'd turn the light on. Mm -hmm. oh, I forget her name. Helen Edis? No. I forget anyway. Uh, Mrs. Come. Murray? No. Um, I'm trying to think of all of the telephone operators. Well, she was on the night shift, this lady was. And uh, she'd call and turn the light on, then we'd call her and ask her what, what was up, you know. And uh, after that, every time that one of the policemen took their vacation, they had swing shift, and they'd take it on the night shift. Many times nobody would take that. Mm -hmm. well, there, and, weren't, there weren't that many people to take it, were there? No, and uh, so I rode the cruiser myself. At night? And uh, I had numerous things that happened. And I was doing all of this for $60 a month, $720 <laughs> a year. And uh, I was born too soon, I guess. And. Uh, so I, I think it was Ed Transu and I, we took a fella down to Chillicothe one time. And uh, one time Boyd Parmalee and I, who was the truant officer. Mm -hmm. He worked the, for the courts in Medina. In Medina. Juvenile court. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and Parmalee's are related to Jerry Hall's, is that right? Well, Don was. Don, Don. married Jerry Hall's daughter. S daughter, okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, John Parmalee. Don Parmalee. Don Parmalee, I'm sorry, yeah. Don and Irene are still living. Yes, they are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And but this was Boyd Parmalee. Boyd. Now, he was a brother to, to, to Don, though, wasn't he? Don yes. and Kelly and uh, uh, Lillian. Right. Mm -hmm. All the Parmalees. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we took this boy out to Boys Town. And uh, we stayed all night in Peoria, Illinois. I see. Mm -hmm. And uh, that night, uh, this boy wanted to go to bed. Uh, his grandmother couldn't handle him. So uh, we took him out there, and we stayed all night in Peoria. And uh, that, that evening, we went down stairs in the, uh, well, it was in the bar room, and uh, a fellow was playing a piano in there, a uh, colored fellow. It was Fats Waller. Fats Waller, wow. That's top, and, that's uh, top billing. Fats, he had, uh, he said, pardon me, and he said, uh, I got a phone call. We were sitting right at the Piana bar. And he come back and he was laughing and jovial and he said, drinks for everybody. He said, my wife just had a baby boy. Wow. And he was really rattling the piano that night. Well, then the next day, we drove on into Boys Town in Nebraska, and uh, we didn't get to see Father Flanagan because he was away. And uh, the fellow that took care of it at that time, uh, he was married to a Chinese girl, and she was the prettiest thing that I'd ever seen. She Is that was right? tall. And uh, he took us through all of the barns. In Boys Town. And uh, Kenny, this, this is so interesting. and We probably will need to continue it. But right now our hour is up and we'll have to call it quits. But thank you again for coming. And we'll continue this. Thanks a million, Kenny. Okay, thank you.